like the average man, you're struggling with work, with your wife, with your kids. And like most men, you're looking for a spiritual life to move past your faults and fears and to help you find strength and peace. At the Men's Academy, we help all men become grounded in Catholic manhood, to become anchored as a beloved son and fulfilled as a strong patriarch, the way you were designed by your creator to live. Now specifically, we support you as a leader, a protector, and a provider, and help you thrive in your supernatural calling as a priest, a prophet, and a king. Brothers, this is Dr. Phil Chavez of the Men's Academy, and welcome to the Beloved Son podcast, where we explore what it is for the Catholic layman to live and to walk in the freedom of the Sonship of Jesus Christ. This is Dr. Phil Chavez, and I'm joined with John Welsh, and we'll dive deeper, as we always do, into how we can move in that mission, the identity, and that journey of our Lord. So before we begin, let's start with a prayer in the, name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, you're just so good, you're so loving, you're so strong. Father, we just want to live in your strength, live in your love, and live in your goodness. Father, just open up the ideas that need to be presented here today, especially as we, we want to look at the Easter season and all the power that Christ brings us. Father, help us to understand something of that power that can transform our lives beyond where we are today. And through the intercession of all the saints, we ask all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, John, so where would you like to start here now that we're engaged and moving in God's in Easter? Our beloved sonship. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. yeah, so we just, just went through Easter, and uh, yeah, I think it just, it's it's a good time to, to kind of talk about, we like to talk about the beloved son's journey, and this will be my first time thinking about Easter in light of the beloved son. I mean, what, you know, just kind of cracking that open a little bit, what do you what does it mean to you to to experience Easter as a beloved son, or or maybe even how are you seeing Easter celebrated in ways that may or may not line up well with, you know, your ethos or your way of looking at our relationship with God? Okay. Yeah. You know, in, in some of our past discussions and, and thinking about some of the ideas we've, we've brought forward, one of the things we have to remember that, you know, when I look a little bit when Jesus came on earth and he became incarnate, that incarnation touched all of creation, all of material creation. In fact, I was reading something recently by another author on that. I even have a good friend wrote a dissertation on Christ's incarnation, how it touched even the angels. So Jesus changed everything just by becoming man, just by becoming flesh, taking on matter. He sanctified everything of matter or everything even of creation. Now, he walked this earth and he taught and he gave an example. He established a church. We understand all that. But then he died as he promised and he rose from the grave. Now, in that very fact that he rose from the grave, he did something extraordinary. And he told us that after he dies and rises, he, he needs to go so he, we can now do some extraordinary things. And so what Easter is about in some respect, now we could talk about what was accomplished and promised in the conquering of our sins, that's true. However, there's a certain now capacity now that, we're in, that Christ is risen, that the stone's been rolled away that there are now new capacities that we now have that are higher than even while Jesus was alive because now he, his glory is now more manifest and so is his power and he promised greater power would be within us. Now, where I'm going at with this is that one of the things that happens, even thinking about some of our past discussions, is that we understand that through what Christ accomplished, he brings great grace to us. But we have to remember, he brings us great grace, so we have greater powers. But what happens is, I think men, especially in the kind of groups, and I know we'll get into this later, that are their enterprises, it's very hard for us men to think out in a spiritual realm. We usually stay in a temporal realm, and Christian men kind of still hug this temporal realm and just expect God's grace to like improve the temporal order how they think and how they act and their virtue and, and, and all the, like the, the natural perfections within them. But you see, with Jesus Christ, when he comes and we're his sons and daughters incorporated into him, we can now move and operate more in a supernatural way. And so we can meet the heavenly father more with a supernatural way. And so we can trust more in the power of Christ in our own power now that he has risen. You know, it's interesting how 
you know, as I said, you know, we, we men, we get caught up. It's so hard for us really to move outside of a natural mode. And now we could depend more on what, what Christ has accomplished instead of what we have accomplished. Because what happens is I find that men, even good Christian men, they carry these yokes, these burdens on them, you know, when they're Christian that they shouldn't be carrying, that they should actually be free from. Now that may be another point, but I do believe Christ's resurrection can give it, bring us to that healing point. But he brings us now to, to an incorporation of what he has accomplished. It's not nor, so much now what we accomplished just with his help. We can now move in him. And so when a man now wants to move in, in virtue and in, and in change, pointing back to one conversation we had that where some things went back and forth in the past between you and I. Yeah, a man wants to improve himself, say if he sees faults in himself, he's filled with anger or envy and thinks he doesn't know how to reckon with or even identify or recognize, thinking that he has to reconcile himself with that in order to meet God. Well, now that Christ is risen, God meets us, and he comes to us. And he, it's not about our power to recognize our faults, but it's his power, and, and it's, his, it's through his power now we can see our faults, and that we get a more of a divine light. And that if we walk with him well, that he can guide us into, to seeing those at a deeper level for what they really are and help us work through them. And so there's something about moving as a son with God in relationship and prayerful relationship where a lot of that power can be manifest because if we don't trust in that. We'll be always trusting in ourselves and in our own power. And that, that's exactly what my internal life has been. Right. I mean, the idea of like, I spent so long on one side, which was like the natural order doesn't matter at all. Like that was like mm. what I grew up in, right? This land where like feelings just are prayers and thoughts are pr like everything is just supposed to be offered up. And like, so essentially I was given, I had no way of understanding my own like human interior life, right? Like everything was supposed to just be like given to God. So like, mm -hmm. that was like my exposure at a time when I couldn't understand what that meant. That was like how I was raised essentially or like formed. So I basically had absolutely no way of understanding or thinking about my own internal experience as like a human person. And like essentially every human part of me was supposed to basically just not exist. Like it was just supposed to be like given to God, whatever that means. Yeah. Right. So like then as I grew, got older and began to realize like, how can it, how I'm also supposed to be like a choosing acting person. How can it be like, how, I don't even know. Like, I don't even know what to do with this stuff. So mm -hmm. then like it becomes this, significantly more of a focus on getting myself right because right. like I would I grew up praying constantly for like these things to go away like what like whether it was being mad or you know lust or you know, scrupulosity whatever it was like I was pretty twisted up inside as a kid and it's like and I'm including you know like teen years in that quite frankly most of my life. Uh -huh. <laughs> but like my point is like what you're saying really speaks to me because I feel like I'm trying to get back to what you're talking about, but from a yeah. place where I actually know what it means, right? Like, sure. Not from this place of like, basically I don't exist as a, like essentially what I grew up with was because God is all powerful. I don't exist as a person, right? Like that's basically what, right. It's like, it's like, no, you just like, you're, you basically don't matter. You don't matter. Okay. Like you're just supposed to give it all to God. And then it's like, it doesn't matter anymore. It's like, yeah, but I don't know how to reconcile that with the fact that I'm like a living, breathing, thinking person. Mm -hmm. So now I'm like, so then I take it way too far the other direction, which is like, yeah. well, apparently in order to communicate with God, I got to like fix all this broken stuff so I can like think correctly and like feel correctly. And then I can get back to God. But then I'm on the other side of it, which is basically I have no connection to God anymore or a relationship with God. What I want to ask you, Doc, I'm sorry, I know yeah. I'm talking here, but that's just how I think that's about okay. it. Sure. What, I'm, what I want to ask you then as a follow up to this is what came what came to me as you were talking was the concept of grace builds on nature that gets talked about a lot, but I, I don't yeah. know that, I don't know that really anybody who even talks about that knows what they're talking about. And I don't know, I don't really know what it means. Cause I mean, people just use it all yeah. the time to the point where yeah, it's, it, yeah, it is. It's yeah. Like, what, what does that mean in light of what you're talking about? Okay. That's a, that's a really good question. You know? Um, yeah, there's, there's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's grazia perfecit not turam. Gra grace perfects nature. And I think what it means is, though, 
it's 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 where okay we, you know our natural faculties have a certain ability in fact okay so the sp three of the spiritual gifts right are wisdom understanding and knowledge right among the the seven or the nine right wisdom understanding and knowledge are three i want to take these examples because these are probably the best and that is is that but on the natural level we also have wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. Wisdom is some knowledge of the highest causes. Understanding is, is something of the, the causes and seeing the nature of things. And knowledge is just to have knowledge, you know, just to know information, things. Information, essentially, like so, knowing information, something. Yeah. So, but you see what happens is now that we're in Christ, we can now, we got certain powers by which the spirit operates in our natural faculties to lift them some, to something higher. So now we could think about wisdom, higher causes now in a spiritual way or spiritualized way. Our understanding can increase. We could see the causes deeper, maybe seeing them in light of not just the nature of things, but in light of God's providence and maybe some bigger picture in the church we don't see. And true, I think, too, even just knowledge, too, I think that can even grow. And that can actually in some way be infused. OK, and in fact, I've known people who've had say infused knowledge and prayerful people get that where i mean you know an angel i don't know if you knew has nothing but infused knowledge that's all it has gotcha okay now it has more infused knowledge than all human beings living on this earth it's phenomenal but it, it has it, it's it's been given that okay we have to acquire that in some way but i don't want to go far afield there but it's about grace working in our natural factors and you have to remember god's work is to work in our nature. It's not to overshadow us. This is why, you know, like with um, the thinking of Martin Luther, God would like, as it were, cover us in our sins, where we as Catholics and as Christians truly, at least traditionally believe, well, in some way, there's a certain covering by God that God gives us in his leadership and his direction, maybe other things, establishment of a church, and he's a father, he oversees us, and he covers us. But he also transforms us. So he transforms us from the inside out, right, in a sense. And so, and so he can transform us by moving us to that greater virtuous life, and it can even perfect the natural the natural level, even physically, too. So... So miracles can come for even physical healing, right? And that, that transcend any kind of natural explanation. So that's also where grace perfects nature as well. But the more important yes. things, yeah, perfects nature in terms of all of our natural faculties and capacities can be raised to something even higher and moving in a higher level. That is definitely, I've, I've never really had it explained that way or thought about it that way. That makes a lot of sense. I think what, like, what comes to me is this, it almost feels like it's like a, is that what, is this what humility is? Like, is, is humility the, like, I guess I, I've been thinking a lot recently about the concept of acceptance. Like, I see so much in my life where what what transpires internally for me is the direct result of an inability to accept things as they are right and it's like but that includes me right <laughs> yeah <laughs> right to oh, I see. Me. So, not just your, right? your outside conditions but your own persona and your own journey like like you know like mean? the like what you're saying that 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 like expression of of the need to change or the need to progress or like whatever that comes from like really I see that the core of that is an inability for me to accept myself as I stand which would I guess flow from some disbelief in God loving me as I am like what like meeting me where I'm at however you want to put that right like finding the balance between cuz I know you're never what you're never saying is like to like that we're supposed to be like stagnant, right? Like, it's not like we just lay back and then just right. like God comes and fixes us. Like that's, right. I know that's not what you're saying, but for me in the same time, it's like this balance between I've like lived my, like it, it's been my whole internal experience. And I think it's many people's internal experience that like the method of progression is effort. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's such a counterintuitive concept to be like active in my own relationship with God while at the same time being like completely passive to his will and transformation of me. Like those two things are almost paradoxical in my mind when I try to put them into practice. 
Okay. Um, I know there's a lot that you said there, but I'll tell you, I got this vision coming to mind. You know, I, was, I remember seeing, well, I see probably The Passion of the Christ, the movie, every every Holy Week. And one of the things you started talking, I realized something that when Christ endured the cross, we say, and that, that's right, um, and he, he lived through it all. Remember his endurance of the cross, we oftentimes think, well, I can't do that. You know, I could never suffer like that. And so we look at ourselves and what we're capable of. When you even look at that movie now, there's something that, that I'm thinking now that really works. In that movie, you don't see Jesus like ramping up his assertive drive. Okay, I can handle this. I can do this. I can take this beating. I can take this whipping. No. What does he do as he's going through his passion? I think he's surrendering himself to the work of his father and he's surrendering himself to what the father has wrought through the Jews, through the Romans, through all the torture, the judgment, all that comes on him. And he submits to it and trust that is submitting to what the father provides that he'll get the strength to make it through. Right. It's not, he doesn't make it through the crucifixion because he's hardened himself up by all those days in the desert and starvation and dealing with wild animals or whatever he had to deal with. Right. Or, you know, you know, he deals with the betrayal of his disciples. Hey, he was prepped for that. You know, maybe his disciples were kind of, you know, floundering even while they're walking with him for three years. No, Jesus didn't. I mean, there was a certain thing he, yes, he, he had formation in a sense on a human level. He developed in a certain level, but, it, it was more about the father's power. It was more about the father did and what the father accomplished, right? And so he surrendered to that, right? Again, so he didn't, he didn't make it through his passion by his willpower. He didn't make his passion by mustering up this determination that, hey, I yeah. am going to make it through this thing. In the movie, you don't see that. You see submission, submission to the father, and the submission is, well, I wouldn't say he is God, so I can't say that's where he got his, his strength, but that's where, where he gives us an example. He submits, and it becomes about, even on the cross, it's more about what the Father accomplishes in him, through him, so than as what he accomplishes. As you're talking, I, I love that. As you're talking, what's occurring to me also is like, I think there's something to just the... And like I, I want, I just want to hear what you think about this. Like I'm happy to be off base here, but it's like as you're talking, I, I see that so much of the way that the faith is practiced, like is literally practiced. And this isn't just like in my way of like growing up in like a maybe more traditional household, or even in like a, a radically traditional household where it may be even like you know borderline heretical or schismatic, right? Like I don't even mean in that kind of you know <coughs> more extreme example, like. It seems to me that the way the faith is like carried to the people today, it is so focused on actions. Yeah. Like I was, I guess I'm thinking like we're ending Lent here, you know, Lent, Lent is over. It's the Easter season now. And yeah. all I can think about is just like, if you, all anyone ever talks about when it gets to this time of year is, is what they are doing this Lent. Yeah. There's like, that's it. And like, it's to the point where I, I have a hard time. I struggle with making sacrifices in Lent because of the degree to which I was basically forced to as a child. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, it doesn't help me get closer to God. It really makes like, it, it basically just reinforces this like tyrannical, angry God image that I personally yeah. am, you know, working to, to, to not see as God anymore. And I, I'm not saying that sacrifice is wrong, but like, as you're talking, it just comes back to me that this is this is the average Catholic, and this is I, I mean literally yeah. the average Catholic. Regardless, of your walk up. This is their experience of the faith: is that when we want to get closer to God, we do things. Yeah, we do to, yeah. to become holier. Yeah, and okay, John. This, now we're coming. We're embarking upon something that's really, really important that I've talked about in other in other podcasts and other realms. Is that we will always stay in that earthly realm in the faith. So long as we're not engaging in deep heart to heart prayer with God, because what happens is when as the church teaches, and mainly through the saints in this level, that through our heart to heart prayer, through our positioning and mental prayer and practicing that daily. And as I like to say, I like to call it living an eternal life in that deep prayer, you can experience God working 
and elevating the way that you're thinking, elevating your experiences, elevating an experience of what it is to be present, okay? A lot of people don't have this deep prayer life, which we're all called to foster, okay? If you don't, if, if, if one doesn't engage in that, they're going to always see things on that earthly level. That's why you notice a lot of homilies, and I, I don't mean to be disparaging a priest, but most priests don't engage well in that prayerful heart-to-heart uh, -heart time, that mental prayer they should be engaging in, which really leads them to a kind of contemplation where you can kind of see it in your eyes. Most priests, when you hear their homilies, they're even those that are done on a very earthly level. And the reason is, is because they're not praying. And what happens is it's the prayer that helps you see to a higher level and incorporate Christ's power and to see it's about his power, not your own. That's where prayer, one of the things, one of the things that helps you see that's about God's power. It's about prayer is about what he does to you, not about what you engage for God. Okay. And so prayer becomes, is the most, is actually the most receptive thing that we, we, we can do. Okay. It's so where we position ourselves, where we can feel in some way overwhelmed by God. If we never have this sense of what it is to be overwhelmed by God and moved by him and directed by him and enlightened by him and stirred by him, which happens mainly in prayer, it can happen outside of it, sure. But it's, 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 its proper place is in a quiet, prayerful setting where we can have that, you know, um, be still. And know that I am God. I love that passage. Why? It's when you're still and you just make yourself totally available to him, totally receptive, and you will know he is God. And so what happens is you have many Catholics that don't really have that experience. I mean, they're doing their laps on the rosary. And I'm not saying they don't experience something of God's grace. They, they obviously do. They may not recognize it as well. But you see, the problem is it's prayer is one that helps you get into this habit of seeing that God is in charge and he is, he is the one operating in our lives. If you don't move in that mental prayer, you, don't, you cannot, I, I believe generally speaking, you cannot see that God's moving and it will just may become all about your actions and not about his actions in you. I think what's, like, what's, what's going on there too, Doc, because... I think I'm just starting to maybe even hear you a little bit differently too, as I'm because we've had this conversation many times. But what's what I'm, what I'm kind of laughing at internally, not laughing at you, I'm, I'm kind of chuckling because it it just kind of occurred to me, and I realized for the first time this is probably what's going on. Like you're using the word prayer to mean something that I don't think most Catholics think of prayer as that. Like yeah, that's right. Prayer yeah. is an activity. That's what I'm saying. Like I'm yeah. saying, even prayer is. The opposite, like prayer to the average Catholic, most, I, I, I would say probably almost all of them, yeah. is the opposite of what you just described. It is literally yeah. about what I do. Yeah. It is about me taking something to God, me bringing my, even just the concept of like me bringing myself to God, like even the offering of my, like it's regardless of, even if you wanted to put it in the most like subservient terms, it's not receptivity. Right. It's yeah. not. It is an outbound thing, not an inbound one. Yeah, and what happens is it stay, and that's that's how youth are taught, right? We give them formulas, we show them what to say, right? So, so you train a youth that way too. Now, paradoxically, and as I'm thinking out loud, you can also train them to love like the mother of God very deeply, just by their own human inclinations to love their mother. This is why too. Even though you could teach a child and you have to sometimes, you know, the, the what to say, how to pray, do these actions. At the same time, you can lift them up deep into a deep spiritual life by connecting them with a father and especially a mother type figure. This is why marrying devotion is best fostered by a mother and a child. In fact, it's a grave crime against a Catholic child, especially to not be fostered in a deep devotion to the blessed mother while they're young because they understand that at that level in their youth. In fact, this is one of the crimes against Catholic children that we're not incorporating them at a deep level of, of true I mean, Marian the, surrender. The problem there is that Mary is talked about constantly, but their own mothers don't model that behavior. So when you tell yeah. when you tell a young child that you're that Mary loves you like mother, 
that doesn't mean a good thing to a lot of yeah, Catholic children. They're like, oh, you mean the Blessed Mother is behind a computer? You know, she. Oh, you mean she's really mad she at me all the time, sheet, and she yeah. she screams at me whenever I don't listen, and like like that's that's what ends up coming away. Oh, from I see. Just saying, yeah, I'm I'm thinking more of the occupational level that they always have so many other things going on. That true. That too. Life. Also, right? Like, mom, well, I mean, for the for the Catholic for the Catholic families where the mom and dad both work or the whatever yeah. it may be, you know, I mean, regardless, my point is you're, uh, you're assuming not, this isn't against you. I'm just saying there's an assumption there that the Catholic mother is living a Catholic motherhood. And as far as yeah. I can tell, there's not a lot of that going on and it's not a yeah. judgment. I'm not saying I'm great at it or my wife is. I just, I see yeah. the, I see the ways that we don't live that out. Yeah, because they have to, a mother has to, all the more so, even more than a man, she has to exhibit what a surrendered life is. Yes. See, this is why the culture is fundamentally pagan, even in Catholic households, Christian households, because it's highly contingent on the example of a surrender of a mother in a home to yeah. see. And that's see basically non existent. Yeah, to see the true, and I'll use the word if I can, to feel the real dynamic of how religion is supposed to operate, how devotion is supposed to move, right? Yeah. And so this is why children too, uh, now there, there's reasons why they suspect authority, but children will never yield to an authority very easily or very well if they don't have a mother who yields to that authority. And I know, I know many, in careful fact, I deal <laughs> with that. I said, careful. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, they're coming for you. No, I, yeah, I, 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 I yeah. completely agree. Continue. Yeah. And, and what happens is, and I, I deal with this men and you and I've talked about this in other contexts, but a lot of men have to deal today with very independent thinking women apart from their guidance and their natural authority they have in the home. And they have to yeah. deal with a lot of the independent drives and aspirations and actions of their wives that kind of evade that or, or, or dissuade them from a life that's more proper to them of surrender and exactly. of moving in that direction. It's true. I mean, it's taken me and my wife years and years. I mean, we, we, we've been working at this for a long time. And I mean, we've just begun to get to the point where I have been able to kind of stand in my leadership of the family and like take responsibility for that in like a real way to the point where I can, you know, say to my wife, we're not, you know, I expect that whenever I ask you to do something and you do that and, you know, you come to me and go, Seb's not listening to me. And it's like, yeah, he's not gonna, because why would he listen to you? when you don't listen to me, if dad's in charge, mm, wow. yeah, if we say yeah. dad's in charge yeah, and then you talk back to me, if I ask you to do something, or if I say we're going to do this and then you start arguing with me, why on earth would he not do that? That's literally you've, we've taught him. Yeah. We've taught him how you respond to authority. That's what we're doing. Yeah. Children don't do what you say. They just do what you do. Yeah. And so, and but it's fascinating to see how with the shift in that, it's fascinating to see how as we've begun to align and, and order our fa our marriage more correctly, mm -hmm. how much easier, how much more responsive Sebastian is to, yeah, to the to the to that like hierarchy of me, my wife, mm -hmm. him. It's it's fascinating to watch, but it it is quite literally impossible for a child to respect, yeah, his mother if his mother doesn't respect like her, if she doesn't respect the father's authority. It won't happen. Absolutely. absolutely. And, and one of the things here, John, this is why it's so important, you know, as much as I talk about, and, and it's right to say that, that we all need the experience of moving in deeper prayer, that obligation, this may sound a little strange. And I don't think I, I may be a little heretical here. It's more important than women than it is for men. Because which, they, which part of it is to, to, to move in a deep spiritual life where they learn about surrender and Not engage that. and see God's action over them. First of all, it's more coming on women because they're more by natural, more by nature disposed toward prayer than men are, right? And so anything which a, a, one of the sexes is more disposed toward by nature, it's more incumbent that they carry that out and exercise that, right? It's so interesting you're saying this, Doc. I was just having a conversation with someone about this, and 
I see, I hear this come up a lot, this concept that for men and women, they may like struggle with different things, but virtue looks the same for both of them. Like the fact that it is naturally more difficult for women to potentially, you know, master their emotions or behave, you know, uh, behave unemotionally, right? Like whatever, like that doesn't change. Like basically, even if it's harder for a woman to do that, like mm -hmm. she still should have an expectation of herself that she can have the same kind of like emotional regulation that a man can. Like that's virtue. Yeah. I think that's nonsense. I don't think that yeah. makes any sense at all to me. Yeah. Like, See, and so like, but I don't know where we, I don't know how we got, like it just doesn't make any sense. You're basically think, saying they're the same thing then. Like I don't expect a woman to struggle with lust the way that a man does. It doesn't yeah. work the same way. Yeah. And I don't expect a man to have the detachment from lust that a woman does. It's yeah. not, it wouldn't make any sense. It doesn't even. Yeah. See what, what happens. It's going to always not make sense. So long as the sexes are combined together. Cause we habitu it was so long as there's co-education and things. So long as there's that women and men, both are going to be led to think a sing virtue is just like, like something that's incumbent in the same way upon both of them. And the yeah. same dynamics are expected. OK, it's very hard to get out of that. Now, what happens is to remember. A man. In the order of nature, he is. That's <laughs> where I got to be careful, too. He is superior in the order of leadership. In the order of nature, she's called to follow him. Now, in the fall, that's not what Eve wanted to do. She wanted he she wanted Adam to follow her lead. OK, so she the, the fundamental, and, you know, in that fact, the curse of Adam came, you know, in fact, God said, because you listened to the woman, he didn't say because you took of the fruit of the tree. He says, because you listened to the woman. So what happens is there's always a temptation of women who want to reach the level of a man or even be his superior. That's why she's inclined toward manipulating him. Right. And manipulating him can be a way she regulates his actions. That's why women are sometimes prone to, that's their vice. I can talk about the men's vices, right? Yep. But they're, they're, they're can be prone toward and tempted toward manipulation a lot, which is kind of control where they take charge. So they want to follow the path of Eve. But where I want to go to John and to, to stay right on this topic is that this is why they need a deeper prayer. First of all, they're not only inclined to it and they need it for that receptive part to be that example, that receptive person. But there's certain truths that women need to see that God will oftentimes only reveal to them in prayer. See, God, in prayer, a lot of dynamics happen uh, and, and un underlies a lot of our spiritual growth and development. But see, what happens is God will speak to you in deeper well, we'll say mental prayer. I know somehow I just don't like that phrase, but but he will speak to you in deep mental heart to heart prayer, where women I've i have known some, and men too. You'll see this where they where they see they don't see correction until they're actually in prayer. It's very difficult for women to see the more profound things, especially where supernature calls her, if she's not in a prayer life where she can actually receive those things. She well, can part hear of that them. Be well, part of that be because like I, I what 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 occurs to me as you're saying that is like a, a, I would say a big portion of a man's prayer is his work, yeah. Like right, like a, like much of a man's daily life is taken up with the work that he's doing, and and right. I feel like that is like very much a, a part like a major part of his prayer is the the offering up of his labor. It but is, but a woman doesn't necessarily have that same like constant attention to something. And has more periods throughout the day where there is space potentially, unless they've got you know a million kids, but that's a whole other situation. But like yeah. where there's room to sit and yeah. perhaps think or be at rest. Yeah, and women are they're they're remember they're more disposed in in by nature toward contemplation than men are. They just are. Right. That's why what's fascinating. It's fascinating when you see you know your average couple where. I wouldn't say I don't want to maybe say average, but more so you will see where the women grow more devotion than the men, right? Because they're naturally devotional. What's a little bit weird is when you see a man who grows in the spiritual life and his wife falls behind, especially mm -hmm. on the deeper interior things. And she can grow in kind of an envy and jealousy and resentment of her husband when he grows. I've seen this many times and she doesn't. 
Why That's is that? Very interesting. Because in the order of nature, she's supposed to be in some way superior to him uh, in, 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 her the devotional life. Life. in the devotional life. This makes so much sense, Doctor, because I've often wondered about this. Like I've often heard it explained, like, and women will use this one too. And I don't mean this is, I don't mean this to be off, like I don't mean this to be like a men versus women thing. I, I find this, it just makes sense to me based on what you're saying. I, I'll hear, I, I know of, I know of men who've, you know, basically tried to work with their wives on, you know, the right ordering of their relationship. Right. You know, and they may say something like, you know, what's supposed to be going on here is like, I'm supposed to be leading the family. You know, if, if you got to say that you've already got a problem, but it's yeah, like, you know, right, it, yeah. if I, you know, it's yeah. like, I'm supposed to be leading the family and it's like, you know, they'll be like, you know, St. Paul says, Jesus, you know, laid down his wife, his life for his, for his bride and the bride is submissive. And, and the wives will say, I'll listen to you when you're like Jesus. Mm, yeah. Right. And what, yeah. what's occurring to me from what you're saying is that's not how it's supposed to work. Right. Like my duty is to be the intellectual thinker of my family and the leader yeah. of my family and God will inspire me. But God kind of expires me through the grace of my wife's devotion. And that is the heart of the family and the, the children, the, the graces of the family perhaps even come F more from that devotion is that is like, am i thinking about this correctly or well, that, that's true we'll get to that in a minute but remember too one of the th struggles that men have is again women in the order of nature and i'll use the word will submit but remember it's far easier for them to do that the younger they are ah. the more they have experience in the world and the more they have experience in academia the more they're going to have a higher level of expectation upon the man who they yield to or submit to. Okay, whatever words we want to use here too. This is why, remember, in the order of nature, women were meant to be married by 16, 17. Yeah. Remember, be, in most of the history of the world, it definitely 80% of women were married before they were 19. Okay, so... So in other words, and that the and there's a number of reasons for that. I mean, not only do they bear the best children when they're 18 years of age, when the healthiest children, but they're able to to yield in the role that a wife has the earlier the age. That's why the Blessed Mother took on, you know, spousal hood, what, maybe 13, I don't know, but definitely by 14, 15, she did. She gave that model. And so what happens is, like, again, I'll repeat, and this is where a lot of men suffer is that their wives have a lot of experience with other scholars, academics, yeah. other men, bosses, yeah. um, experience in politics, the political order, and, and all kinds of other things which they've immersed themselves in and have yielded to for so long. And then, you know, the average woman gets married at what? I don't know, 26, 27? I don't know. It's closer and, to 30, I think, now, average yeah. wise. And so, yeah, it was probably 26 when I was a kid. But, but anyways, yeah, it's close to 30. So they got all this worldly experience. Yeah. And so you better believe they're going to have a lot of, if, you, if they're going to yield to a man, you know, they, they've, they've developed habits outside of that. But if they're going to do it, he better really be a man I can look up to, you know. So, yeah. so this yeah. is one of the tensions that, that's yielded there. So in some way, all the more so, you know, she needs to be, a woman definitely when she's, you know, beyond those years say of, of of natural well of engaging in that early marriage you know where she is in academia and in the workforce all the more so is prayer really incumbent upon her because it helps counter all the kind of uh, all these other influences that lead her as i say to be independent to be self-sufficient and to be competitive because most women are engaged in those three I'll use the word dynamics. Dynamics of moving in an independent mode, a competitive mode, and a self-sufficient mode. And that will cause her to, to more and more make it difficult for her to yield to her husband the way she needs to and to be that example, that Christian deferential wife. So basically, back, bringing this back to the, to the resurrection concept, I mean, the, the idea here would be that for women specifically, and I guess I see too that that I see women where the devotional life is so much ordered around. And I know this can be a temptation for men, but I just don't think men engage in it as often, probably because they're not actually praying as often either. But like I see so much of the the nature of devotion being like the reading of spiritual works that, to be quite honest, I don't think 
that anyone has any business reading unless they're like mystic already, <laughs> right? Like these yeah. deep theological works that just, like, but they're just like reading book after book after book of like these deep saints writings. Yeah. And then also mixed with like the constant devotions, like devotional practices, right? Like the, I'm going to say these prayers every single morning and I'm going to say this thing and I'm going to do this thing yeah. and I'm going to run this novena and I'm going to run this thing. Like, so what you're like, essentially, it sounds like what you're saying is like for both men and women, but particularly for women, the passive receptivity to yeah. God's transformation in basically an, an, a directionless prayer, not like, not no point, but I mean like not a prayer that is based around some activity, but rather nothing but the openness to whatever God has in that moment to say to you or just to exist with you. Yeah, you bring up a really good point, and I've, I've never, I've, I haven't thought about the way you expressed it. What happens is I find when women get engaged too much in an academic way and, um, and uh, you know, in a masculine way where it becomes very academic and it becomes very much about how many things that you're doing or the things that you're doing, they, they can lose their way in that. In fact, they actually build up this spiritual wall, if that's the right way of putting it, to men. I've seen this with highly devotional women. They, they, you know, a lot of them who want to be married in some way, there's a, there's a dual part of their personality where their spirituality kind of like uh, builds a wall for themselves where they're laying down cement and bricks with all this knowledge and all this practice and all this devotion that eclipses it where in the order of nature, yes, to your point, their, their devotion doesn't need to rest on a lot of knowledge. Women should grow more than even men should based upon their interior life of contemplation. You know, like the, the blessed mother, you know, and she, she, she pondered these things in her heart. There's something about women where they don't, they just need their experiences, their general knowledge. Not that, I'm not saying they shouldn't read all the rest, but they need to be, depend much more on their receptive, passive nature for God to teach them and for them to ponder instead of growing in all of this knowledge, because it will provide a barricade yeah. um, with, with a husband or meeting one in the future. Yeah. I, I've definitely, I've definitely seen that as well. And not even necessarily with a husband, but just be right with any male figure it basically becomes this, like you have to prove to me, um, you know, you have to prove to me that, you know more than I do so that I yeah. can like listen to you or something. Yeah. And that's the side of it too, is, is the fundamental disregard for the different nature of men and women, which is that uh, like, this is the part that's so odd to me about it is it's like, I, I've tried to like think through this before and I've even tried to speak with some people about this. Like I don't make any, I don't make any pretenses to like being able to make a baby. I don't have a womb. Like yeah. it's very easy for me as a man to fully recognize and be very clear about what makes a woman a woman and what sets her apart. But, but the, the work that's been done in society culturally and inside of the church um, to basically turn women into men, yeah, there's absolutely no acknowledgement of what makes a man, man, like to, yeah. to suggest that a man thinks clearer or to suggest that a man with like that a man doesn't actually need to have a deep, deep, intellectual understanding of something to be able to see what's right and what's wrong. Like yeah. I, I've had these conversations with my own wife. Sometimes it's fascinating. Like she'll bring something up and I'll just be like, that's not correct. Yeah. And then she'll be like, well, how do you know you didn't? And I'll just be like, that's not right. I don't really care where it came from. I just know that's not right. Yeah. And then like a month later, she'll be, she'll like find somebody explaining why it's not right. And I'm like, cool. I didn't need that. I knew it wasn't right. I, that's, mm -hmm. that's what I have as a man. That's my, that's my power from God. Yeah. You know, I don't really disregard it. Yeah, I know we're going in a lot of different directions here. And I mean, we're sort of staying on a certain thread. But one of the things, and we'll close very shortly, is that, you know, the thought that I came is that what, one of the things that, that men are facing, and I speak with this a lot because I know you're young men dealing with the marriage and all those dynamics that you see in yourself and families and all the rest. And I'm trying to explain, too, some of the things that happen in marriages, which I think some of the things I try to lay out in those challenges of faith, because I know you're very interested in that. But one of the things that happens... I remember hearing Chad Ripperger talk about how si not seeing things for what they really are is actually a mental disease. And I never really thought of it that way. I just thought it was just warped judgment, which it is. But he actually talks about in terms of mental disease. And I started to think about that a little more because it becomes a mental pathology when we stop 
rec stop recognizing the natural things for what they are. Now, to get back to what you're talking about, what we're talking about, rather, these basic natural roles of women and, and that they're being denied today, you know, their natural aptitudes, they're denying them. And it's almost like, you know, as, as we continue to live, you know, without that reinforcement of prayer and the divine you know, power of the resurrection and, and just leave ourselves to ourselves and we live in modes of life which are, become contrary you know, to, to the paths we're supposed to take, we almost become mentally diseased when we stop recognizing just the simple, factual, you know, apparent things in nature we should be seeing. And a sign of just this warpness is this, you know, the zany transsexual type stuff where we should just be able to look at this and just immediately, I mean, absolutely immediately say, this is perverse and wrong. Why? Because it just looks wrong. There's no debate here. It's just sick because it looks sick, you know. And so the society is so gone so far from the realm of reality, it can't even see basic things of intrinsic sickness in your face and, uh, and it tends to justify and actually support it. And we're, we're in movements now where, you know, there's wrong, there's, you know, there's something wrong with you if you don't accept this transsexualism, you know, that's going right. on. And so I see that that's a, that's an extreme of what's happened where men and women both, and this is why I do what I do. We're missing just the simple factual things, what it is to be a man and what it is to be a woman, because we're living in a society that's kind of deranged, but we also participate that on a certain, maybe lesser level when we lead lives, which dissuade us from, from, from seeing these natural realities for what they are. That's very powerful. I think that's a, yeah. that's a good place to end as well. But yeah, that's exactly, I think what I've, I think mean, that's exactly what it is. So, um, yeah. okay, well, good. Well, till next time, glory be to the father and to the son and to the Holy spirit. As it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen. Our guardian angels and patron saints. Pray for, pray us. for us. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to the men's Academy YouTube channel. You can also find us at the and donate there. If you feel so moved, God bless.